thank you so much um, for joining us for tonight's Zoom program. My name is Amy. I'm one of the adult services librarians at the Ironically Public Library. And I'm excited that you've been able to log in. Uh, tonight's program is being recorded. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, um, I'd like to acknowledge that several of our elected officials are in attendance tonight, and we're very grateful that they can join us. Tonight's program is called Meet Asa Dunbar, African American Pioneer on Irondequoit Bay. Our speaker is Brighton historian Mary Jo Lamphere. I'm very grateful that she agreed to us during Black History Month a time to pay tribute to generations of African Americans and their countless contributions to this nation. Mary Jo has held the position of town historian in Brighton since 1986, and she's also worked in the Ontario County Department of Records, Archives, and Information Management Services. She has degrees in both English and American history. During her remarks, all the participants in tonight's program will be muted, you're welcome to post any questions in the chat box. Those will be read and responded to at the end of the program. Before the Q&A, we'll be delighted to hear from Councilwoman Katrina Freeman, whom I'd like to thank for sending the resources on Asa Dunbar to myself and Greg Benoit, the Rondequate Library Director. All right, so Mary Jo, um, it is all yours. As long as you can just first click, I just sent you a link to, to unmute. Did that come through okay? Sorry, just one moment. Good evening. <laughs> Sorry about the confusion. I'm still learning Zoom technology. Thank you for inviting me to speak tonight about Asa Dunbar, somebody that's uh, kind of important to the history of both Arondequoit and Brighton. Uh, as you know, he came here very early on, and uh, so there aren't a lot of records about him. But uh, because I worked at the Ontario County Archives for many years, I did find quite a few uh, documents about him. So I'll be sharing with those with you tonight. He's a very interesting figure in the history of this area. He came early to the frontier. He was very tall. He was of mixed race ancestry and he had skills that were in demand by the settlers who followed him. When we look into the life of a pioneer, we try to determine the, the push and pull factors that impelled a person to leave his home in a settled community and make a new life on the frontier. The push factor for Asa is difficult to determine, but the pull factor is very likely the possibility of prosperity in the Genesee country. Get that slide here. Okay. In 1779, under the orders of George Washington, General John Sullivan conducted a punitive march on the Seneca villages in New York. The soldiers destroyed villages and crops, causing great hardships for the Senecas. And when they returned to Massachusetts, they, the tales of the fertile soil, abundant produce, and excellent climate they had seen sparked an interest in migration by New Englanders, especially those in Western Massachusetts. That may be how Asa Dunbar, living in Plainfield, Berkshire County, Massachusetts, uh, and earning a living as a charcoal maker, learned about the new lands in the West. As you can see, that's the map of Massachusetts in 1796, and Plainfield is, is highlighted there. Charcoal making, the distillation of wood to its carbon content, was an important process in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. Because it burned hotter and cleaner than wood, 
Charcoal was used by the furnaces that produced iron, as well as for the forges of the blacksmiths who shaped it. Asa Dunbar learned this skill in Plainfield, Massachusetts. Asa was the second of six children born in Braintree, Massachusetts, to Samson Dunbar and Patience Crouch. Born in 1754, he and his brothers, Joshua, born in 1760, and Samuel, born in 1762, are said to have participated in the Revolutionary War. In 1784, Asa married Elizabeth Odell in Sutton, Massachusetts. Joshua Dunbar married her sister, Lydia. Lydia's application for a widow's pension based on her husband's Revolutionary War service provides the information that neither she nor her husband were ever slaves. This statement then would apply to Asa and Elizabeth Dunbar due to the familial relationship of the two couples. Elizabeth Odell Dunbar was the sister of Hannah Odell Wheeler, the wife of Ephraim Wheeler. The authors of this book uh, have included information about the Dunbars in this nonfiction book published in 2003. It's the, uh, called The Hanging of El Ephraim Dunbar and it's full of information about that time period. The hanging actually took place in Lenox, Massachusetts in 1806 which is well after Asa and his family had arrived at the landing. Asa Dunbar is described in early uh, history books as mulatto. We don't use that term today because of its derogatory connotations, but the people who wrote the history books in the late 19th and early 20th centuries did, using it to describe a person whose father and mother were of two different races. By several accounts, Asa's home country, Berkshire, in the western part of Massachusetts, was a diverse place with a mix of religious sects, farmers, laborers, African-Americans and native people whose varied traditions and old and new ideas pulled in different directions. Other authors point to the gradual departure of native peoples as newly freed blacks came into the Berkshires after the American Revolution. It would seem to have been an ideal community in which to live for a mixed race family, but for some reason, Asa Dunbar packed up his family and moved west in 1791 when he was 37 years old. This picture of the 1790 census of Plainfield, Massachusetts indicates that uh, Asa Dunbar had five uh, other free people in the column there. So he was listed there as a person uh, of uh, mixed race. And this is the 1791 assessment roll for the district of Canadargue, the town of Seneca in the district of Canadargue. Uh, at that time, Ontario County was divided up into four districts and uh, Canandargue was the one in which Seneca was located. Asa and Joshua Dunbar uh, had, were living in the town of Phelps. A Dunbar genealogist says that Asa was living on Arondequoit Bay in 1791. The two situations are not exclusive. Asa could have been living in Phelps at the time of the assessment roll and uh, moved on to the landing later in the year. In 1791, William Henscher and his family were on the east side of the Genesee River near the lake. Orange Stone and his family were on East Avenue in Brighton, what became Brighton, and Peter Schaefer was near the river. Not many near neighbors for the Dunbars. Asa provided for his family by hunting and fishing and taking advantage of the fruit trees growing near the landing, remnants of the Seneca presence. He is also described as making salt from the marshy areas along the bay. Salt was a necessary commodity for the preservation of food and the tanning of hides. Deposits along the freshwater marshes were another product of the glaciers that covered the, this part of New York State. Ice sheets covered the natural salt deposits and water formed brackish subterranean pools. As the glacier melted, the salt pools began to flow, covering the ground and turning the soil white. It was a simple process for Asa to boil away the water and harvest the resulting salt a commodity that he could use to buy or barter for goods that he and his family needed. An anecdote from Asa Dunbar's life is described in Margaret McNabb's book, Tryon in Brighton. It seems that Asa went raccoon hunting after dark. His dogs treated an animal and Asa climbed up the tree to investigate. The reflection from the animal's eyes made them realize that it was something much larger than a raccoon. So he quickly backed down the tree and built a roaring bonfire at its base to keep the animal from descending. At daylight, he shot the trapped animal, a panther that brought 
a $5 bounty. This is a lot map for the uh, Tryon area, the upper right corner. You can see uh, a scratch of Arondacoit Creek going into Arondacoit Bay. That was the Tryon area of uh, Brighton, what became Brighton. After John Tryon developed his commercial village at the Arondacoit Landing in 1797, he persuaded Asa to come and live there. Asa had skills important to the new community. And at six feet, seven inches, his height alone was an asset. He was awful, often called upon to help when someone was building a log cabin. He was able to raise his end of the log to a height of six feet, while it required three men of ordinary height to hoist the opposite end. Much of what we know about Asa Dunbar comes from early government records. In 1796, the town of Northfield was formed by the New York State Legislature in response to a petition signed in 1795 by the residents, including Asa Dunbar in his distinctive handwriting. His uh, handwriting is kind of buried there in that document. I've highlighted it a long time ago and the highlighting turned brown, but uh, the arrow points to Asa's handwriting. The 1795 petition, uh, Northfield was the parent town to the present day towns of Brighton, Henrietta, Arondequoit, Henfield, Parenton, Pittsford, Webster, and the part of Rochester east of the Genesee River. 12 years later, Northfield was divided into Boyle and Penfield. Boyle lost Parenton in 1812 and became Smallwood in 1813. And a year later, Brighton and Pittsford were divided, uh, uh, were created by the division of Smallwood and created by the state legislature. Until 1821, with the formation of Monroe County, the court and land records of these predecessor towns are found in Ontario County. And I've got some more pictures here. This is the Burr Atlas from 1829, which shows the towns pretty much as they were in 1821 um, when uh, Monroe County was formed from Ontario County. As you can see, Brighton's northern boundary was Lake Ontario and our western boundary was the Genesee River. The eastern and southern boundaries were pretty much as they uh, uh, were uh, from then on uh, with uh, our boundary with Pittsford and Henrietta and a little bit of Penfield. But that's how things looked back then. There's a line across the map just above the word Brighton and that was Township 14 in Range 7 and that became the town of Arondequoit in 1839. And let me see what else I've got here. Okay, and this is the 1799 assessment roll for the town of Northfield in Ontario County. So just a year later, the town of Northfield that had been created collected taxes. And as you can see, Asa Dunbar owned property valued at $796 and was paying tax of $1.16 on that property. And the next one is the 1800 census for Northfield. As you can see in this one, Asa is enumerated with all the other people. So he wasn't separated out as a person of color, which is kind of interesting. And I'll show you one more census record. This is the 1810 census for Boyle, which was the town that was formed in 1808. And again, Asa's uh, uh, there in the census, but you can see that the people in his household are separated out into the column of the people of color in the, in the right side of the, of the page. Let me see the next one. Okay. There are numerous civil court cases uh, in Ontario County involving Asa Dunbar between 1794 and 1818. Many of them concern trespass, an all purpose term that's described in Black's Law Dictionary as unlawful interference with one's person, property, or rights. At common law, trespass was a form of action brought to recover damages. In Asa's case, it was used most often to recover money he owed. On the frontier in this period, cash was short. Purchases at Tryon's store, for example, were most often made on a barter system. Barrels of wheat, ashes, salt, or other produce could be traded for tools, fabric, spices, medicine, candy, school books, bed cord, china, or alcoholic beverages. Hannah Dunbar, Ace's daughter, bought a straw bonnet, probably adding to Ace's tab at the Tryon store for the Tryon and Adams Company sued Asa for debt in 1802. That same year, Asa was appointed a highway overseer for Northfield. It's unlikely, however, that an income came with the job. In the Ontario court, County Court records also show that Asa traveled to Niagara in 1812. 
whether that had to do with the war or whether he was on business, we just don't know. That he was there in November of 1812 comes from an 1817 document that states he was present at the death of Ella Hughes Scudder, who died on Johnson Creek, about 40 miles from Niagara. This document would have been very important to have for the Scudder family, because with it, they could prove that their uh, Ella Hugh was in the service and could probably obtain a, a pension from that. So this was, again, it, it, Asa's as, assigning this document was, uh, was very important. Asa Dunbar, in turn, sued other people for trespass and collected damages on several occasions. One notable case was his 1810 suit against Joseph Northrup, who allegedly broke into Asa's stable and stole a horse and bridle, which he later sold. Asa collected $150 in damages. In 1812, when he was 58 years old, Asa was, uh, was uh, attacked and severely beaten by two men in Lima, New York. Presumably, a Asa was in Lima on business for Tryon and Adams, his employer, who had a store, store at the landing and at Lima. Let me put this in here. Uh, they also, um, the two men kept him tied up for 24 hours in addition to with a beating. Asa's suit against the two men sought damages for pain and suffering as well as replacement for his attire, which included one coat, one waistcoat, one pair of breeches, one cravat, one shirt, one pair of stockings and one hat of the value of $50. That was an expensive outfit for that town time period. It also indicates that Asa Dunbar dressed as a gentleman. Asa's suit against Pierre Moon and Rufus Weber, the muggers, sought $500 in damages. As you can see, the jury awarded $150 plus court costs of six cents. Some accounts have described Asa Dunbar as a squatter, a person who lives on land he has not purchased. The circumstances of the time would indicate that might be true for the first few years of his residence. When Asa arrived at the landing in 1791, the county seat and location for deed registration was in Canandaigua, a long distance from the landing. There's no reason to suppose that Asa traveled to Canandaigua before 1807 when he was tried for assault and battery. In all the previous court, ca court cases, he had, had hired an attorney to act in his place. And by the way, that 1807 court case for the assault and battery went to a jury who deemed him not guilty. The assessment rolls indicate that Asa owned improved land worth $1,225 in 1813. And in 1818, he, owed 100 acre, he owned 100 acres in Township 14, Range 7, the part of Brighton that became a rendezvous in 1839. The latter roll might reflect the location of Asa's first residence on Rondequoit Bay which would mean he bought the land on which he is said to have been a squatter. I've got a map here that shows uh, Arondequoit and Brighton in 1872, quite a ways beyond um, the time that Asa was there, but still I wanted to show something that illustrated both the towns. In 1818, there are no, after 1818, there are no official records for Asa Dunbar. He would have been 64 years old that year Changes at Tryon may have influenced his decision to leave. In 1808, John Tryon died. His partners in the Tryon Company, Amasa Adams and Augustus Griswold, foreclosed on a mortgage they held for Asa Dunbar. It was well known by 1817 that the Erie Canal was going to take commerce away from Tryon, 20 miles south of the canal. The non-resident Tryon heirs sold off the property willy-nilly, having no real knowledge of the place. And by 1818, Asa Dunbar may have decided to relocate to leave the dying community. Another reason for leaving may have been a lawsuit brought by Asa and Nathan Nye against William Perrin. The 1818 uh, document right here charged, uh, um, charged Nathan Nye with bringing Asa to Canandaigua to the Court of Common Pleas. Nathan Nye, Nye uh, filed this affidavit on November the 6th, 1818 that he was unable to bring Asa to court for the present term, but he felt sure that he would be present for the next term. But he wasn't, we know where he was. We think he moved to Burley Falls, Ontario, Canada. The Dunbar genealogist, Robert Paul Dunbar, who lives in Rochester, has found Asa Dunbar in Cramahay, Ontario, Canada in 1820. 
and believes that he died in Burley Falls, Peterborough, Ontario, about 53 miles north of Cromahay. The little red mark, the Google mark of the map there shows Burley Falls. And uh, I don't know whether you can see Coburg on the map, uh, almost due south of that red mark, but that's where Cramahay was. And you can see where Rochester is. So it's almost a direct shot from Rochester to Cramahay to uh, Burley Falls. Um, Asa and Elizabeth's son Cyrus also studied, 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 settled in Burley Falls and married Altine Dickerson. Their son George Erastus Dunbar, born, born in 1829 in Canada, is said to have immigrated to the U.S. between 1848 and 1850 and settled in Irondequoit. He and his wife, Susanna Hinson, had nine children in Irondequoit. And here's another view of the 1872 map. And somewhere on there is the uh, property of Asa's descendants. I wasn't able to find it out uh, without access to the records of the Monroe County Clerk's Office. So uh, I did want to show a map of, of uh, Irondequoit as it is uh, in 72. So that's the end of the story, um, the end of the talk. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them after uh, Mrs. Freeman talks. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. Um, next, we'll have some remarks from Councilwoman Katrina Freeman. Uh, I just sent you a message about unmuting, so hopefully that came through and Thanks. please feel free to share your ideas with us. Yes, I got it, Amy, it came through. Thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank everyone first and foremost. This is an awesome turnout um, and I am quite pleasantly surprised but also extremely excited for you all to join and to learn about Acer. Um, it is my honor to continue in Acer Dunbar's footstep by bearing the witness to the contributions of Black people to the growth and development and success of Aronagui. He is our first um, African American um, settler in the era. And it just seems just like bringing everything full circle that I am speaking to you now as the first African-American and person of color elected to the town board in Aronicoid. So it's a, it's a great honor and it's continuing in that um, growth and trajectory that Asa has started. Asa's determination, his tenacity uh -huh. and dedication to be a full participant in this community in a time when um, African Americans enjoying that kind of um, freedom and liberty is not heard of was for me um, inspiring. It actually inspired me to run for office, but to continue to, and it continues to inform and guide my work today, especially the work that I do as chairperson of Aronda Coit's commission, Advancing Racial Equity, also called I Care, as well as my work um, within the community as a mom and a parent of an East Ridge senior, Lancers. <laughs> and finally, what I wanna say is I look forward to I Care and the Ronacoy Public Library um, to um, collaborate on offering more conversations, more um, presentations about um, our wonderful people of color within our community who have contributed to local and as well as state history. And not only doing it during Black History Month, but I hope that we can do it uh, throughout the year. Again, I wanna thank you all for, um, for being here. I am just, I'm speechless because I'm just so pleased to see so many of you. And I hope that you become, you'll be able to admire and come to love um, Asa Dunbar and his brothers and his family the way I do. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mary, for sharing uh, your information and knowledge to us. You have done a lot of work and I am extremely grateful to you for that because it was reading one of your um, articles about Asa that is how I got introduced to him. Welcome, so thank you. <laughs> thank you so very much, um, Councilwoman Freeman. That's um, much appreciated. Um, so at this point, we'd love to um, answer any questions you might have. You're welcome to post them in the chat, and I'll read them aloud and ask Mary Jo to okay. uh, share any thoughts she has, please. 
Um, the first question we have tonight, scroll down here. Um, Mary Jo, please, it's, um, did the term mulatto always refer to at least one parent being of African descent? Pardon me, I didn't hear that, Amy. Oh, sorry. Um, did the term mulatto always refer to at least one parent being of African descent? Okay, yes, it does. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's um, there are all sorts of other words that were used. And again, they were derogatory words to describe different degrees of, of color. But for, for mulatto, yes, that was one parent was white, one parent was black. Um, another question, um, are there any surviving relatives of Asa Dunbar still in Irondequoit or Brighton, depending on the boundaries? Well, the, the one that I mentioned, the person I'd been in touch with is Bob Dunbar. He lives in the 19th Ward and um, uh, he, I, he's visited my office. We have collaborated on uh, material about uh, Asa. In fact, that's how I knew that he was in Burley Falls. And uh, uh, there's, there are several people around the country who are descended from the Dunbars because they were a very large family. Not only um, uh, Asa, but his brothers had children and uh, the Asa's children had children. Was it Cyrus that had six children or nine children? So it's a big family. And yes, there are people still here in the Rochester area. Great, thank you. Are there any more questions that anyone would like to post? Oh, okay, here's one. Um, is there a street named after Asa and Irondequoit? Ooh. That I don't know. Oh, so no. I think has to take that one. <laughs> if not, there should be. Yeah, I agree, yes. Oh, Councilwoman Freeman, let me unmute you just a moment. That's okay. a great idea, and it will be one that I will um, look into. I think it's Good. a great idea. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if you could, Mary Jo, could you um, share one more time um, the year that Asa was born and the year that he passed away? He was born in 1754 in Braintree, Massachusetts. And we don't know his date of death. That's the sad thing. We know that he was no longer in this area after 1818, but uh, he would have been in his sixties by then uh, when he moved to Ontario. And uh, Bob Dunbar believes that he may have died about 1820 in Burley Falls, Ontario. Okay, thank you. And another question, um, this is also in regards to a rondique. Is there a marker or any physical signage near his lands today? Hmm. I'll bet Pat Wayne would know that. I do not know that. <laughs> okay. I can ask, um, Pat Wayne is the Rondique town historian, um, so I can yeah. check with her. There are two places, two references to the Dunbar holdings in a rondique. One of them says it was the Evershed farm and another one says it was the Buckland farm. Both of those families are, are similar to uh, the names we have in Brighton. So, uh, but I don't know which is which. I, I, I was, again, unable to find them on uh, a contemporary map of uh, Rondequoit. So that would be something for the Rondequoit historian. Okay, I will follow up with her, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question, I think, um, Mary Jo, I can answer this one about, is there a plan to share this information with the school districts? Tonight's program will be shared through the Ironicoid Library's um, YouTube channel. And then um, we can certainly send that um, to the different school districts um, so that information can be shared. Thank you, that's a great idea. Thank you everyone for all these uh, great questions and conversation. Uh, is there any other thoughts or questions that you'd like to post in the chat? Oh, okay, here's another one. Um, 
Do you know, Mary Jo, why um, Asa Dunbar moved to Canada? We don't know. Um, he was foreclosed upon. Uh, the mortgage he, he, he was holding was foreclosed upon. So he probably didn't have a lot of money at the time. Also, the place where he was living uh, at the landing was um, the, the community was dying there. The, the, the community of Tryon was dying. And uh, he may have felt that it was time to move on. Uh, the, other, the other pressure was that, well, this was later on. In 1830, uh, Austin Stewart went to Canada to assist with the establishment of the Wilberforce community, a community of escaped slaves that went to Canada. But this was, Asa's leaving this area in 1818 was quite a bit earlier. So I don't think that was why that, that he was going there particularly to form a community of uh, free black people. I, I think he just got up and moved and maybe there were other people there, but we don't know that that pull factor that got him to Canada, unfortunately. Okay. The factor was probably the, the disintegration of the village, but we don't know what the pull factor was. Thank you very much. Uh, we had another question that came in. Um, why is it unlikely that Asa re um, received a salary for his highway position? I think I think you mentioned he didn't receive a salary, right? He might have received a salary, which is okay. probably more of a volunteer thing. You, you were elected for a year to this position of, of road viewer or, or whatever it was, and uh, you, you didn't really uh, get paid for it. You just uh, were assumed it was a volunteer position, I believe. Okay. Not the way appointments are today. You get some salary with appointments today for, for government service. Right, yes, okay. And then the same person was curious, do we know if Asa's children were part of the African-American culture considering their mixed heritage? Don't know. They were part of the community, we know that. Uh, there was a school formed at, at Tryon for a time. They may have gone to school there because they probably would have been about the right age. So um, we don't know that. At, as itself, we know that Hannah bought a straw bonnet and, uh, somewhere along there, but don't know much about the children, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments that anyone would like to post in the chat? We have another message from Councilwoman Freeman saying, um, I want to thank everyone for attending tonight. Uh, it warms my heart to see so many people interested in the life and contribution of Asa Dunbar to our town's history. So thank you. And um, another question about, will there be other presentations like this throughout the year? Um, I certainly hope so. We would love to participate um, as a library um, with the community and planning some. So certainly I will take that feedback and speak uh, with our library director and and see what else we can plan. So thank you for that idea. Another question about, are there any books on the life of Asa Dunbar? I know Mary Jo, you referenced, I, I wrote down one title, you said it was um, Tryon in Brighton. And then there were several others I think you used, right? Yes, the, uh, the book called The Hanging of Ephraim Wheeler does mention uh, Asa Dunbar, and that's available. Uh, that's not out of print. It's um, published in 2003. Uh, he's mentioned in the Tryon and Brighton book. Uh, there was also a book written, oh, maybe 20, 25 years ago called The City of Frederick Douglass, written by Eugene Du Bois. Uh, it was published by the Landmark Society, and Asa does have a, a, a mention in that book also. I know when we were looking up some resources um, to do a display at the library, we found his name also listed in the New England Geological and Historical um, Society mm -hmm. uh, pamphlet, as well as several pamphlets from the Rochester um, Historical Society. And we have those on display. Um, so if you'd like to visit the library, um, anyone who is interested, um, right next to the information desk on the first floor, we posted several different um, copies of census records and some of these different pamphlets that mention Asa Dunbar, and you're welcome to take a look. Good. We all hope we all wish he, we had a photo of him because he sounds uh, like, of course, such a tall person. <laughs> but yes. uh, unfortunately, we we don't have one. So 
we're, we're making people with census records. <laughs> Very tall. I have to imagine my town supervisor, Bill Maley, who's six feet eight. And uh, when I think about Asa Dunbar. Oh, that's a, that's a good analogy, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, and then um, one other comment. Um, someone said that there's a Dunbar Street in Rochester in the zip code of 14619 that might be related to Asa Dunbar? Maybe that's where the Dunbar, Maybe. where Bob Dunbar is now, yep. Okay, mm -hmm. sounds good. And thank you, Councilwoman um, Romeo. Thank you for our wonderful presentation. We hope to see many more throughout the month and into the future. Appreciate that. So thank you everyone so very much um, for attending tonight's program. Thank you to Mary Jo Lamphere and Councilwoman Katrina Freeman for speaking uh, to us tonight. Um, this program has been recorded and will be made available through the Aronicoate Library YouTube channel. We'd love to have you um, watch it again. And uh, stay tuned. We're hoping that we can uh, definitely work on more programs like this in the future. So thank you so much, everyone, very, very much. And hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.